What's cracking, Anakids? This is Ashley Bonner, founder of the Indie Educational Video Game Studio, Electric Anakid. And I'm participating in Thomas Brush's Start a Game Studio Challenge in 12 months. Uh, you'll see in the image, there's a hashtag 12 months game studio link and also a Discord available for you to join. Now, I've been having trouble um, with my uh, Unreal Engine crashing, and I've had a couple of days of troubleshooting it, and so I've just figured out how to solve it. Now, what I did was I went to the Epic Games launcher, and admittedly it seems kind of obvious now, but it wasn't when I was looking for it. Like, I, I went on Google and all these places, and then nothing. I mean, there were a lot of different possible solutions, but none of them worked, and I wasn't sure why there were so many different solutions. So, um, what happened was I had an older version, a 2016 version of Unreal Engine, um, and I needed, and I kept getting a crash report, which you'll see in the previous videos. And um, so the newest version out is 4.24.0, and uh, I don't have internet in my apartment, so I don't have it downloaded. As you can see, it's only like maybe like two percent downloaded. So uh, this video today is going to be me just showing you the release notes about the new version and all the new stuff that's going to be available for us creators, us devs. And um, it's just going to be freaking awesome. So I'm really excited. Okay, so but before I start, let me just show you how to install new versions or uninstall um, Unreal Engine versions. Okay, so what they have here is there are two different libraries, which you can see right here. They have the main library, which is for your games and things like that. Um, you can see like what you downloaded and what like and those kinds of things. Then they also have an Unreal Engine library. So you will go to Epic Games Launcher, Unreal Engine link, and then, then go to the Unreal Engine's library. And that's where you see all these kinds of things right here. It'll tell, show you your current version right here. And then when you push this plus sign, you can see all the other uh, versions that are available. So. Um, if you want to, you can remove a slot by pushing this little X in the top left corner, or you can also push another X at the bottom, well, and right now, cancel the installation. But let's say I want to get rid of this super old version, this 2016 version, how do you do that? You can push this X right here and uninstall it. Um, let me go back, Unreal Engine, link, and then um, the library for, the, um, for Unreal Engine. Now, I'm, the 4.24, let me uh, let me slow down. Go back one more time. Unreal Engine and then Library. I was really, I was so confused. I was like, what the heck? I'm so confused. So I was going like here to this library, and then I went to Unreal Engine. Then it went to this Unreal Engine, and it just kept saying launch it. You know, launch this older version. And I'm like, well, how do you uninstall it? I'm so confused. How come it doesn't uninstall from the control panel? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we got to talk to Unreal Engine about that. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's uh, a little convoluted. I mean, in hindsight, it seems kind of obvious, but for me, it wasn't at all. It really, like, set me back a little while. And, I mean, even I didn't just just recently I saw the answer. So that's how you uninstall um, Unreal Engine and how you install new versions. Okay, so... Now, uh, later on, I will install the newest version, but for this video, I'm just going to do the release notes of the 4.24 version, which just came out, I believe, yesterday, um, November 8th, 2019. So, okay, let me just move over, and I will get to the release notes, and then I'll do the other things that I usually put in these videos. Now, this video may not be two hours, but... That's all right. Um, it's uh, still we're gonna learn a lot, and then um, it's just gonna. And then tomorrow I will do a video of me uh, working on Mark Wahlbeck's um, Evo Cube um, tutorial. Well, it's actually, I may start the tutorial again in in the 4.24 version. And now I do know that some of the uh, features in the 4.24 version are still in the beta, so they may not be fully production ready, but they are still just, you know, they're, they're working on it and whatnot, those kinds of things. All right, so let me just go over to the next section and let's get started. All 
All right, we've arrived. Yes, we are going to make things and give it to the people. So, um, I'm super excited uh, to finally have fixed the problem, honestly. I don't have any tea, tea, any tea today because it's like it's like 10.30 at night. So, I'm actually about to go to bed because I have work in the morning, that kind of thing. So, um, yes, I'm actually am gonna, just really excited. I'm excited to get back to creating things. And I'm so excited to get back to learning new things. And really excited to possibly have fixed the problem. Though, I will have to see that after I actually uninstall the 4.24 version to make sure everything is fixed. Alright, so, now, here we are at the Unreal Engine 4.24 release notes. Um, and, of course, the, you know, they'll have all of the different changes they've, they, uh, they've been making at, uh, at, uh, through GitHub. And all of the uh, changes that have, been, um, that have been submitted by different people and things like that. Now, where can you find the release notes for all of the Unreal Engine versions? In uh, the Unreal Engine docs. <laughs> so, um, you can go Unreal Engine and then, uh, you know, search for release notes or something like that. Okay, so, I'm just going to, like, scroll to the page and just, and just read a couple things. And that way you'll have an idea of what's coming up next in the Unreal Engine um, 4.24 version. Now, of course, when you watch this video, it's probably going to be, like, a couple years from now so 4.24 is going to be super old but oh well i'll do it anyway okay so let's see what's new in the unreal engine 4.24 version <laughs> all right so we'll be more productive of course more realistic more realistic worlds um let's see Oh, that's cool. So it's got this uh, this awesome uh, non-destructive layer-based landscape. And then you can, like, as this thing says, you can, like, build terrain that will adapt to other elements in the world. And the sky will automatically update. Cool. I mean, of course, our sky does that, right? Right? So why shouldn't it do it in Unreal Engine? I don't know. <laughs> All right. So and they also have this new... Uh, what is it? Experimental strand-based hair and fur system. So your the hair can flow like, like real. Not my hair, of course. It's really short. But you know the hair of the people, your characters, or um like <laughs> the fur of the animals, things like that. You know, uh, like on Shrek when um Prince Charming takes off his helmet and just throws his hair. Yeah, it's gonna be kind of like that. Might put a little little meme here or something. <laughs> All right, so let me just skip through all this stuff, and uh, the right beginning, and it'll, it's going to actually show us more things. Now, just to um, shout out all the people who have submitted uh, these 98 improvements uh, from the uh, developers on GitHub, I'm going to just highlight all their names right here, and you can just see them and congratulate all these people working hard to make Unreal Engine better for us, and uh, you know, really just um, just really working hard to do that for us. Alright, so, one thing, having said that, because I'm not doing the tutorial per se, I'm going to have a little bit of music in the background at a really low level. Uh, it's by this rapper named Microphone Phoenix, and she's really freaking awesome. And so, it's going to be very, very, it's going to be very, uh, just, you know, low-key, low, low-key low in the background. Just to, you know, fill in any gaps uh, in the video, because I'm not actually doing a tutorial. All right, cool. So, um, I am excited, so excited to just see everything that's new. Uh, I read a bit of these new things um, on my phone a little bit earlier, so now I'm just giving it to you because in case you know you want to go back later on and see it, what happened here today. Okay, so major features in the Unreal Engine 4.24 version, let's see. They got uh, landscape non-destructive editing, which is in a beta version. Um, so the outer environments are more flexible and efficient. Um, and I will play just a smidge of these YouTube videos, just to give you a, a little, little bit. I usually don't play videos on my channel because, you know, copyright and all these things. I think you can do 30 seconds, but that might be music. So I'm not going to play too much of it. Alright. So what do we have here? Okay. That's cool. 
Okay, it's buffering, 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 buffering. All right, so I'm just gonna pause this and keep going. What else do we have to work with? Let's see. <laughs> Oops, exit, okay. All right, uh, okay, I think we're good. All right, so. So now these uh, non-destructive landscape layers used to be called non-destructive landscape layers and now they're called landscape edit layers um so you can add oh okay so yeah so you can add different uh, multiple layers to your landscape and you can just like cycle through them independently and um it won't it, it won't affect other things so that can be really great for like um just building on top of your different layers and really making it realistic and making, um, you know, the, the physics and all that really realistic. Um, and to do that in the 4.24 version, you can enable the landscape edit layers feature by checking edit layers under the manage layers tab. And as you know, you guys can see, uh, you uh, eggheads, not you guys, because of course we're not all guys. Um, I'm just reading what, what, what the release notes are saying. So I can't wait to try that and uh, really just get into it, um, uh, you know, later. So um, you can also look in the area of the documentation called the non-destructive landscape layers and spleens, splines, splines, splines. Does anyone know how to say that? Splines? Is it splines? Spleens? It looks like spleens. Anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> All right, so they also have new landscape blueprint brushes. Um, you can change uh, terrain uh, using shapes defined entirely in blueprints. You can add overlapping brushes and the system will just put them together to display the final result. And so, man, that's so cool. I mean, you know, eggheads, people, human beings on the other side of the camera. Not guys or men. All right. Um, darn me being a northerner. I'm always saying guys. Um, working on it. Let's see. Okay. So what exactly is the landscape blueprint brushes? Uh, they have a 2D spline. Spleen. I'm going to say spleen. Shape. And properties that we really can specify materials, meshes, fall off, and a lot more than that. Um, you can also add some blurring, noise, curves. You can also um, add some height maps and layer the weight data into the brush by overriding this render event. Do I know what this stuff means? Not really. No, not yet. I'm nine days. Oh, that's not nine. Nine days into this challenge, and about four of them were used trying to troubleshoot Unreal Engine. So, <laughs> so I haven't actually been hands-on in Unreal Engine yet. But I'm really going to work hard. Um, segue really quickly. I do plan to do more videos uh, to do more hours during the day. Um, if I have more time because I'm, I'm really getting excited about learning a lot. And two hour, two, the two to three hours that Thomas Brush uh, recommends for the challenge, there's not really feeling enough. I, I want, I'm really excited and I want to do a bit more. So I may be putting up uh, some videos uh, that are not specifically two to three hours. Of, they may be just me actually working on uh, my, my game and actually maybe starting to get some of my game began, like, you know, the first bits of it, the prototyping, things like that. Okay, so, oops, I didn't mean to push that. Let's keep going. All right, so I'm going to show you just a smidgen of the uh, landscape blueprint brushes YouTube video, so uh, hopefully I don't violate any copyright. Uh, my videos are not commercial or anything; they're just there for you to learn and 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 you know to get some resources and all these things. And join me on this journey. Okay, so let me play it. Let's see what we have here. That looks like a big, what, steak for a dog or something. <laughs> what in the world? What is the sound on this video? Hmm. Let's see. Not 
things. Oh, oh, it might be like a in bed thing. Uh, anyway, and then it buffers. Let's just get rid of that. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Okay, so they're rotating it. Okay, so you can do these kinds of things. That's as much as I'm gonna show for it right now. <laughs> Alright, let me just pause it and keep going. Alright, so. Alright. So, note as they say how to use the blueprint brushes, you want to enable the landmass plugin. Um, and you can do that through, I believe, edit plugins. Don't quote me, I don't actually know. I, I, admittedly, yeah, again, I haven't been really in Unreal Engine a lot, so. <laughs> I will figure that out later. Okay, so, but if you know where the plugins are, then you can find this landmass plugin. Okay, so, and which is experimental, um, and you can get from the landmass plugin, you can get um, examples from how to use the landmass, the landscape blueprint brushes, and a blueprint called the BP camera overlap. Um, you can uh, overlay photo references on the screen match up the camera perspective, and then draw shapes into the world based on the reference, as seen below. That's cool. Man, oh my god, this is ridiculous. <laughs> well worth the 5% that you'll have to pay if your game sells $3,000. Um, forever. Alright, whoa, that's cool. Okay, so, what else is new? You got physically based sky atmosphere component. Um... Oh, whoa, that's cool. So you can use this uh, this physically based sky atmosphere component to create an Earth-like atmosphere that actually changes depending on the time of day. Um, you can create, as they said, ex exotic worlds. You can improvise um, the ground view with sky and area perspectives. So, oh, wow, including grounded space view transitions. Man, that is cool. So, like... Oh, wow, that's cool. Man, they are really working on this and really improving it a lot. <laughs> so we have some pictures of as it, you know, the sky is changing as the time of day uh, changes. I don't know if that's based on, like, the the time that we set in, like, um, some, some, some sort of setting or is it, like, the time on our computer or something? I don't know. Pro probably some sort of time of day that we set. Um... You know, like within Unreal Engine, not like tied to our computer time. I guess that'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Anyway, okay, so let's see. Oh, whoa, that's cool. Look at the moon. Oh my gosh, that's cool. Okay, so what what does this new uh, physically based sky atmosphere support? It supports uh, physically based atmospheric attributes for Rayleigh in my scattering, ozone absorption, and light multi scattering. I, I, I don't know what that means. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't even really know. I really, But I do want to know. That I want to know. If you want to know, you're doing pretty good. Okay, so. Um, artistic direction through atmosphere properties and custom material setups. Dynamic time of day setup. And integration with a sun positioner plugin. Um, different area perspectives. You can uh, do that for ground the sky, outer space, and planetary space views, detailed debug visualizations, and a lot more. <laughs> and to find even more information about this, you can go to the sky atmosphere documentation, which I will one day when I have like a lot of time. I just want to do a lot of reading. I'm just kidding, actually. I actually will read the documentation. Um, yeah, it's so much there, and so much to just learn, and so much to just really just get into the depths of the Unreal Engine software. <laughs> All right, so they have a simplified sun and sky workflow. Uh, so what can you do with this? You can set up a physically modeled sky. Try the placement of the sun based on the geographical position and time of your scene and watch the sky respond to the sun based on the real world laws that govern atmospheric scattering and absorption. 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 
So, oh, that's cool. So, so like they're, they're like literally just uh, modeling it after our actual atmosphere. Wow, man. Whose games are going to be freaking awesome? Ours. Our games are going to be awesome. Yes. Because a lot of people working hard behind the scenes. All right, so. So it uh, connected different components, like the new sky atmosphere component, and it um, does some geographically accurate sun positioning, and it has a standard outdoor lighting setup composed of a directional light and skylight. Cool. And then, note. The Sun Sky Actor is a default sky setup in most of the template projects. Um, and you can find those in new categories such as film, television, live events, architecture, engineering, construction, automotive, and automotive product design and manufacturing. You can go to the Sun and Sky Actor page to find even more information. So, another new feature of the Unreal Engine 4.24 version is the Screen Space Global Illumination, which is still in its beta, fa beta phase. Um, So this can come with all the normal limitations of such uh, of this effect, this screen space global illumination, um, but it's scalable in, uh, across the console and desktop platforms and offers a dynamic GI solution um, that uh, puts a little bit of strain on the performance, but uh, it'll just really boost your, um, you know, your illumination of your scenes. So, we have an image of this, um, let's see, I'm assuming maybe it's this, uh, you know, this, this, this sunlight part, I guess, oh, oh, here we go, no, no, sorry, here we go, it's a little bit smaller, so one is with, where you see the one is where it's enabled, uh, let's, okay, let me do that in a second, so we have a little bit of freezing on the part of my computer, all right, so I'll get a little bit smaller. Okay, did it get small? Mm, okay, wow. Oh, see, this right here reminds me of. Have you seen the movie um, Robots? It had um, what is his name? Um. Okay, what happened to the pictures? Here they are. All right, here we go. Oh, right. Let's see. So, anyway, number one is the part where the uh, where it's enabled, and number two is where it's not, which I assume is right here. Um. So yeah, that definitely looks a lot a lot better. <laughs> All right. Oops. Uh, let me go back. Cool. Anyway, there, this uh, little thing reminds me of um, the movie Robots with uh, Robin Williams and some other people. Anyway, it's like a cartoon and they have, they live in this world where um, there are robots and like the trash cans talk and the, everything's electronic, that kind of thing. And there aren't any humans or anything like that. So this is a GIF, so I can play it real quick. I don't. No, it's actually gonna. Oh, there's a gnome behind it. That's weird. Uh, oh, here's number two. Here we go. Okay. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So, all right. Cool, cool, cool. So here's um one. As you can see, it's a lot more illuminated, and then number two is darker. All right. Cool. So awesome. So you can u enable it using R S S G I dot enable. And control it using the command r.ssgi.quality. And you can choose the value between 1 and 4 for different quality levels. Alright, so I'm going to zoom in a bit more so you can see. And you can use the post-process volume settings under the global illumination. Category to control its indirect color and intensity. And go to the Screen Space Global Illumination documentation if you want to read more. 
So another new feature is the live universal scene description stage, which is also in its beta, uh, beta phase. <laughs> All right, so let's say you have some USD data, which is universal scene description, and uh, this helps make it more intuitive and efficient um, by at adding some full two-way synchronization. You can update the content in the engine when the USD data changes, and you can also edit it, the scene and write the results back to the disk. Uh, it gets rid of this, the time-consuming import process and uh, gets rid of the duplicate asset data. Uh, the universal scene description stage live also supports static meshes, cameras, skeletal meshes, variants, animations, and materials such as preview surface and display color. More advanced people know what this means. Uh, I don't know what this means. It really, I mean, I know like a little bit, but not much. That's okay. I'll learn. And you'll learn, and we'll all learn, and we'll make lots of games. I know we can do it. I believe in us. All right, so, and this also supports the third-party USD plugins. Another new feature is DataSmith and Unreal Studio for everyone. All right, so, so because the beta program was successful, um, which, mind you, had 250,000 subscribers from a range of industries, They've added Datasmith and other Unreal Studio features for all users to enjoy for free. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you just have to say free and I'm there. I mean, F-R-E-E, -E, I'm there, I'm there. Where is it? If it's free, I'm there. You know. <laughs> so Datasmith. I don't exactly know what this is either, but let me just keep reading. So this is the easiest way to get entire pre-assembled scenes into your Unreal project from a wide variety of third-party design applications, such as 3ds Max, Cinema 4D, SketchUp Pro, and many, many others. Um, Datasmith pres preserves the object hierarchies, surface materials, textures, light and camera properties, um, re-imports workflows, and a ton more. So if you want to read more, you can go to the Datasmith area in the Unreal Engine documentation. So a couple of other Unreal Studio uh, features is, um, is only available in the Unreal Studio, and such as the Variant Manager, and where you can set up different versions of your scene and switch between them dynamically, which does make it a lot easier for you to uh, edit scenes and see any changes as you go along. Uh, you can also do static mesh editing and defeaturing, which is uh, or mesh simplification in the static mesh editor. You can also now do jacketing, which is uh, these tools that can you can call uh, fully occluded actors and mesh geometry from the level, and you can also create new UV projections in the static mesh editor. And <clears throat> the final uh, Unreal Studio only feature that they posted onto the release notes is the collaborative viewer template where you can set up a multi-user design review experience uh, on desktop, VR, and mobile platforms. Okay, so now, as usual, you know, Mac OS and Linux got, you know, a little bit of abandoned while, uh, you know, Windows was like, yes, we got it first and things like that. So, Datasmith as a 4.24 version is available on Mac and Linux platforms, depending on the type of file you are importing. Um, so that's great for the Mac OS Mac, sorry, Mac OS X and Linux users. I'm a Windows user. Um, I know a little bit about Mac and a little bit about Linux, not that much. But now you uh, people who do use Mac OS or Linux have to at your disposal Datasmith. <laughs> so another new feature is the visual data prep. Again, also in this beta version. Um, what can you do with this visual data prep? Let's see. You can take full control over what happens inside the Datasmith import process, reduce the manual work it takes to prepare your 3D scenes for real-time visualization in Unreal Engine. So this bike demo, what do we have here? Um, lots of things. 
<laughs> lots of things. Um, lots of different things are happening here. Uh, shows your static meshes, current screen size. And I'm gonna keep going to show you this picture as um, you know, we just as you see, we're in that data prep area, nice and clear. So, what can you do with a visual data prep system? You can build a complex sequence out of simple steps. Um, they have this blueprint-like graph editor, which can help you with these data preparation tasks. Uh, you can merge geometry together, remove or replace unnecessary actors. You can uh, replace materials. You can also control tessellation and generate data like light map UVs, uh, detail levels, collision measures, all that stuff. Or you can also create standardized recipes. Recipes. And uh, you can apply these when you import a scene and reuse them in projects. You can also combine multiple input scenes together, blending the results into a single data smith scene hierarchy. And finally, at least in this release notes, is you can uh, validate your graphs results in the preview windows. So really you can see like everything pretty much real time. And I mean, if you create things, you know, we create things. Um, it's really great when you can, when you can, um, you know, see things changing in real time. So, you know, you don't have to wait and then wait and then wait. And then finally it renders or it exports. And then you're like, that wasn't even what I wanted. So now you can see it with all these kinds of things in the preview windows. Okay. Another new thing in the Unreal Engine 4.24 version is the project creation workflow uh, improvements. And, um, oh, yes, this is useful. I mean, okay, it's all useful, but I actually know genuinely what this means. So now <coughs> when you create a new project, they have a wizard available to help you really truly get to what you want to do. So, um, smaller steps, they're easier to understand. Uh, you can, um, you can easily just navigate to what you want to do. So instead of having like it used to have, you know, you'd have like the different little pockets with the little pictures. You'd have like, you know, blueprint up at the top left and then C++ project. Now it has this cool wizard right here um, where you can select or create a new project. You can, you can choose between games or film, television, live events or architecture, engineering, construction or automotive product design and manufacturing. Ah, and I'll play the GIF or, or GIF or I'm going to say GIF because GIF is like the peanut butter. So I'm, I'm just, I don't, I don't like, to, I don't like to combine the two things. So I'm not going to do it. Okay. So here's the GIF showing you how you can use the wizard and create some cool things in Unreal Engine 4.24 version. Okay. So you can start a content, ray tracing disabled or enabled. Uh, cool. All right, so let me keep going. Apparently, GIFs don't work like YouTube where you click it and it stops playing. I don't actually know how to pause this thing. I, only once in a while do I watch GIFs. Usually, like, what are they? Um, funnygif.com, that's not right. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, it's meme GIFs. Oh, yeah, meme GIFs. Those are funny. Now, uh, the templates are now organized into uh, temp, uh, different categories based on the discipline or like, you know, the kind of work that you're trying to do. Um, gets, it reduce, reduces confusion and only displays the settings and questions that apply to the chosen template. So yeah, again, they're making Unreal Engine more user friendly, but I would recommend uh, for this version to make the install and uninstall process more user friendly. <laughs> just like, just like, Put it in the control panel or just um, something like that where it's a bit easier or either only have one library um, like the library for your games and but don't have like an Unreal Engine library or or just to simplify it a lot put the uninstall and reinstall in new versions uh, right right within the home version of the Unreal Engine link so we're not searching around I mean, apparently I'm not that smart, but um, for me, it was a struggle. 
a little struggle. Maybe we just, you know, just put it in like a maybe a slightly more, you know, less hidden place. <laughs> okay, so let's get going. So now we're on to the hair and fur rendering and simulation, which is also an experimental phase. Now, um, this uses a strand based workflow which renders each individual strand of hair with physically accurate motion. Okay, you got eggheads. Soon enough, we're not going to be able to tell these games apart from real life, especially with VR. I mean, that's crazy. That is crazy. Whoa, that's so cool. Now, I don't know if this is like real hair or if it's Unreal Engine hair. It looks pretty real to me. I mean, well, well, what do y'all think? Is this real? I, I assume it's I assume it's using the strand-based, uh, what is it called? Strand-based workflow. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Now let's see. Now this release, the strand-based workflow uh, features. Uh, you can import a limbic groom from an external DCC application like Maya or 3ds Max. Um, you can set up groom components. You can author and edit hair materials and use Niagara to set up hair physics with some tweakable settings for customization. And you can, for more information, you can go to the hair rendering and simulation documentation within the Unreal Engine docs, doc, documents. All right, so next new feature is the in-display setup improvements. Um, the new, with the new uh, changes, it's easier to create immersive experiences and they synchronize um, your under engine content on multiple devices or projectors. So you, this it's gotten rid of the special pawn and game mode classes um, that were used to be required by in display, and instead in display automatically creates a new type of component at startup, which is the display cluster root component, which attaches to the active camera. Cool. And at every frame in display, um, uses the, the position and rotation of this root component as a starting point for the hierarchy of scene nodes. Cool. So it automatically renders from the point of view of the active camera. Awesome. And if you don't want this um, to assign the display plus the root component automatically, you can add one yourself to any blueprint uh, as a child of any camera component. Oh, cool. So this can work for almost pretty any much uh, project. And again, to read more information, you can go into docs and look up rendering to multiple display displays within display. All right, so the next new feature is ray tracing improvements. It's the like, a ton of new features, optimizations, and stability improvements. All right, so my image is not coming up right now. I'm going to just keep on going. Just keep going along, going along, going along, and making new stuff and learning new things. All right, so let me just scroll down some more. Okay, so what does the ray tracing improvements uh, come with in the 4.24 version? Let's see. You have first class support for instancing, makes rendering instance status static meshes and hierarchical instance status messes that meshes more efficient and uh, better for larger worlds. Uh, additional geometry that includes just a lot of stuff like world position offset, um, more support for reflection multi samples per pixel denoising, and Multi-view support for virtual reality and split screen. And you can go in the real-time ray tracing documentation to find more about this um, and really just take your game to the next level. <laughs> All right, so there are a couple of trade-offs in other areas, but it's going to help you with your runtime performance in the long run. All right, so to pass algorithm and other things are going to happen. So the next new feature is the runtime virtual texture updates, uh, which is also a beta version. Okay, most of this is beta because I think it like it was released yesterday. 
So, um, you know, it's still in its little kind of, you know, stage, but it's getting, it, it'll be there. All right, so, once I've virtual texture and it's become more efficient and stable, um, and they're working, and of course they're working on it, working hard, and so we can create more and output more and just give the gamers uh, the best experience ever and just really create the worlds that we want which we can do because we're awesome and we're dedicated and we work hard to create things all right so now there are four runtime virtual texture material options base color base color normal roughness and specular which includes a note uh y c o c g base color normal roughness and specular and world height which is completely new in 4.24 in the in, in the two in the 4.24 version of unreal engine now in the note for the um base color normal roughness and specular is that for any runtime virtual textures that we're using base color and normal material options in 4.23 they have these have all been converted to base color normal roughness and specular 4.24 okay so cool that's you know gets clearer makes it easier to find you don't have to you know guess around things like that so uh let's see So now when you're working with new streaming virtual texture builds for the runtime virtual texture, um, this used to be like a pretty slow process um, because it used to cover large worlds with, with a ton of actors. And, and now you can bake these low resolution nits um, to stream to the runtime virtual texture. So the higher resolution MIPS are still rendered at runtime, and um, so you can use both uh, streaming and runtime approaches. And they've also improved the runtime virtual texture asset settings, um, which allows you to optimize and tune the generated runtime virtual texture to your own projects and platforms. Another thing that they've worked on is uh, added a new runtime virtual texture base color storage. Um, and you can find that under the um, YCOCG base color, nor, um, normal roughness and specular. And you can encode the base color in the runtime virtual texture um, area. Again, I don't really know what this stuff means. I just really don't have any like beginner stuff to show you right now um so i'm gonna keep on reading and I'll upload this video anyway give me some resources and then you know give you the fun activity and and then go to bed uh so yeah so um another new thing is the new runtime virtual texture normal storage did i just already read that no i didn't okay so normals are now stored with X and Y values in a BC5 texture or in the alpha channels of two BC3 textures. And the normal Z direction is stored, allowing for the storage of world space normals. Another new thing is the new runtime virtual texture asset actions. Um, there are two new, two new actions. Um, from the runtime te virtual texture asset right click context menu, which are fine materials using this and fixed material usage. So fine materials using this finds and highlights in the content browser. Um, it, it finds all the materials that reference this runtime virtual texture assets and the fixed material usage action, the second, the second action. Uh, provides an automatic way to fix the materials after changing a runtime virtual texture asset material type. And then it does a couple more things. Okay, so the next thing they've really added, and they've really done a great job, is they've added some scalability options and console variables. So, 
Um, this will increase your performance, optimization, and scalability uh, for your projects. So you can adjust them per project and per platform as you see fit. All right, they've also improved the runtime virtual texture pool area. Um, they've changed the syntax so it can contain multiple textures, which are, uh, and, they'll, and they'll be referenced by the same virtual texture page table entry. So these pools are all set up per texture format group and tile size. And the tile size is now defined as a range of sizes. And um, when defining the allow size scale, the r.vt.poolSizeScale scalability setting uh, will apply to these memory pools. So next, they also working on the runtime virtual texture parameters and they have a new node called the runtime time that really what runtime uh, time virtual texture parameter something like that and this created by directly or by selecting convert to parameter in the context menu of an existing runtime virtual texture sample node it works it's pretty much the same as a runtime virtual texture sample node but exposes the runtime virtual texture asset being sampled as a parameter for material instances to override. And this only applies to the runtime virtual te texture assets that are of the same material type that's set in the runtime virtual texture sample parameter node. So they have to match have the same material type for this to actually work. So now they also have new inertial blending which is, <coughs> I'm not sure, but I, 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 let's see, let's play a quick YouTube video. <laughs> All right, so let's see what they have here. Okay, so it says the left side is standard blending and the right side is inertial blending. So I guess when they move, it moves in a better, a more, um, Realistic way, I'm assuming. Okay, no, here we go. All right, all right, it's gonna tell me. <laughs> I forgot. So, what is inertial blending anyway? I don't know. So, it's a high performance alternative to, to, to traditional animation crossfading that produces natural tra transitions as a post process. Okay, so once this is activated, the source pose is no longer evaluated at all. And in contrast to, to the traditional blending, which evaluates both the source and target poses for the duration of the transition. Um, to combine them, inertia blending kind of just um, skips over the source pose and just goes to the movement. I, I assume this is what this, this, is, this, this is what this is saying. So, uh, the, it, and this was uh, contributed by the people at the coalition, which will boost performance in Gears of War number four. So you can look at the blend notes document blend nodes documentation to find more information. Next new thing is animation blueprint linking, which is also in the beta version. I'll play the quick little YouTube clip and we'll, then we'll just keep going in this video, which is actually pretty long. Yeah. Now he's doing it's doing it's doing jumping jacks, so it clearly has a not per se a man, but has a male, you know, body. Um, doing jumping jacks. Cool. Getting that good cardio. <coughs> Burning those calories. <laughs> All right, so the animation blueprint linking is an extension to the sub and name instances, instances system, which is enables, which enables dynamic switching of the subsections of an animation graph and can result in significant memory savings because of you know various reasons all right so an uh, animation blueprint linking also allows for easier multi-user collaboration and you can look in the using animation blueprint linking documentation for more information next new thing is the control rig track in sequencer which is an experimental phase control rig tracks are now embedded with all the other tracks in the sequence and so you can animate control rigs in the context of a cinematic. Next thing is the audio mixer enabled. 
you know, little component. Um, it's enabled by default, and it uh, bring is bringing an enhanced audio feature set to all the platforms, supported by Unreal Engine. Cool, nice. Now it already uh, supports the existing features in Unreal Engine 4, such as the uh, sound cues, sound classes, sound mixes, attenuation. Um, <coughs> it also adds a lot of new features, uh, such as a new submix graph for applying post-mix DSP effects to groups of sounds. Um, you can also apply DSP effects to individual sound sources and other features. It also has a common audio EAPI for third parties, so you can do that too. Next new thing is audio stream caching, which is in the beta version. Uh, it enables Unreal Engine to load the audio at any point and release it when it has not been used recently. Um, most of the audio data is separated from the U sound wave asset and divided into uh, separate chunks at cook time. Cool. I like separate chunks. <laughs> so you can reference a lot of audio assets as, as you want without using up your going past your memory boundaries. Uh, so if you're an engineer, you can load and reference chunks of compressed audio without relying on state managed by the audio engine. Popular for open world games where it's hard to figure out how much audio you'll need ahead of time, you know, as people just peruse the whole world. All right, next thing is the audio mix modulation, which is also in the beta phase. It's a new audio mix system, and it enables you to have better control over the common audio parameters from the blueprint and component systems. Features of the new um, audio mix modulation uh, include, you can create generic, flexible, and decoupled mix system. Um, you can enable robust, robust uh, set of tools for auditioning and debugging a game's mix, and you can also provide an API that can be easily extended and used for further modulation of audio units. Yes, next thing is audio synesthesia, which is also which is not also in the beta version right now. Um, you can now drive animations, effects, other elements that are tightly coupled to the sounds being played in game. You can expose the extracted audio analysis data for gameplay scripting, which is cool. Again, my images are not coming up, but that's okay. I'm going to keep going. Now, what's next? Also, next is the sound cue templates, which is also beta version. You can enable the pro, uh, which enables us, the programmers or you know, you know, developers, to build sound cue node graphs in the code, which uh, enables consistent and reliable iteration. Uh, general classes are inherited, and it's also possible to expose only specified parameters in the nodes to designers. Another new feature is the variant manager improvements. Um, you can set up different variations of your scene and toggle the visibility of whole actor hierarchies by changing a single property. All right, and here's a quick little short little clip from um, on your engine. So let's see what we have here. They've improved the variant manager. Um, for us, so we can do just a lot more things. Lightning, or okay, cool. So we can change the what did I say? Front wheel, awesome. Okay. So we can activate the new auto expose button in any var on any variant to make it automatically record all changes. You make to the actors and properties in the current level. You can use a new switch actor in your level to control the visibility of the whole trees of child actors, but only one child of the switch actor may be visible at any time. So, if you set one child invisible in the variant, then all the other children and, and their descendants will be hidden. They've also expanded the types of actors you can use with the variant manager. So you can also uh, work with post-process volumes and uh, string properties. If you want more information, you can go to working with scene variants and the using the switch actor documentation 
in the Unreal Engine documentation um, area at docs.unrealengine.com. Next new feature is the in editor UV improvements. This gives you more advanced control over the way textures wrap around your static mesh assets by creating new UV layouts in the Unreal Editor. Okay, images, skip it. So, you can use the unwrap UV command in the contextual menu for any static mesh asset, or you can launch it from the toolbar of the static mesh editor. You can also tweak the angle threshold and the area way to control the resulting layout. And the third thing you can do, and you can do more I'm sure, but you can also save the new UV layout in an existing channel or create a new channel for it. If you want more information, you can look at the Working with UV Channels uh, documentation. So the next new thing is Data Smith Interop Improvements. This uh, you can help you work with. Uh, you can help work with. Uh, they've been improving how Data Smith works with third-party applications and file formats. So the Alias Studio, they've completely re reworked it for us. You can make automotive visualizations visualizations faster, easier to create, um, and, and they've made all of the importing of the alias model in sync with how the Datasmith behaves with other different, uh, type, different types of files. So you could, they've improved the surface tessellation, um, they've, you can now create new master materials based on the shader models using alias. You can also find the properties that are similar to the ones that you already know uh, about in Alias. So you can easily work, uh, tweak things and change things, and so because you know, you know, because it looks familiar to for you. It all uh, you can also import layers that you set up in your Alias scene right into your Unreal Engine editor. So now. Uh, with th these changes have became some other changes. They've moved the dot wire file support out of beta. All right. So what what's up with, with 3D Max? What about 3ds Max? I said 3D Max. 3ds Max. What's up with that? What's going on with that? Now, DataSmith now supports V-Ray Blend materials or V-Ray Blend MTL from 3ds Max. It converts them to automatically to the new master materials and material instances in Unreal Engine. It's now faster to export most scenes, and especially when you're using certain objects like the Forest Pack Pro objects. SketchUp. The importer now inverts UVs correctly on import. You can now assign texture materials from other sources to your SketchUp models, and assign materials from SketchUp to other Unreal Engine assets, without the textures flipping upside down. <laughs> All right, so the data smith importer now orients the models uh, the same way as models exported from other applications, which helps with consistency. It also um, scales the uh, vertex positions in the static mesh geometry instead of changing the scale of the actor. So this that would be really helpful if you're uh, working with uh, SketchUp and things like that. Um, you can also rename components in Unreal Editor without the importer creating unnecessary duplicates when using SketchUp, and it also supports metadata where that you can attach to your SketchUp um, files. Revit. You can all easily visualize Entourage, um, and you can also create actors for the project base point and survey point. Um, the name of your Revit view is now uh, within your exported file name. Um, and you can do many other things. You can avoid visual clutter as 2D level symbols are not ex no longer exported. Um, and other, other things when you're working with Revit. If you're working with CAD, uh, you've got, you'll see some improvements with the object hierarchies, object naming, and importing tech, tech, technical metadata. AXF. 
Uh, improvements you'll see if you're working with AXF improve visual fidelity and they remove dependencies on third party technology. Skip the image and then here's a note. As of this release, AXF import is no longer provided by DataSmith. So if you want to import an AXF file, you can enable the importers AXF importer plugin. So when there's large scenes and data sets, um, it, uh, Unreal Engine does a lot of things like imports, select and deselects, toggle visibility, deletes actors, and generates UV layouts. Now, if you're working with RoboMerge, a uh, beta version, I've never heard of it, but it now, uh, what, what does RoboMerge even do? It synchronizes large-scale development across perforce streams by monitoring commit, commits and descriptions for commands that tell it to merge between branches. So uh, the, just to note, the robot merge tool and source code are provided as is. So yeah, get it if you want. If it breaks, they may not fix it. <laughs> That's all right. You know, they're kind of busy doing a lot of other stuff. So new thing also is build agent, which is in its beta version. All right, so I'm just going to go over and... Go through a little bit more, and then I will um, go on to the um, resources, and then the fun activity, and the other thing. Okay, so this is maybe the last thing. So the next a great thing is build agent. You can manage your agents on a build farm, and it supports the fast cleaning of Perforce workspaces. It also helps you parse errors and warnings from build steps. And it can uh, also have some fast stream switching from with the local cache. You also have new uh, air, new vert, new um, uh, features in the auto SDK, and also new features in the extended editor UI layouts. This will improve the usability and efficiency. It can be saved and loaded as well as shared with other users. So let me just play the video really quickly. Interesting that the videos popped up, but the images did not. So the videos seem to be really small, so I guess that would make sense. So here is the extended editor UI layouts, where you can, you know, make it just even just a way, just a super freaking awesome UV layout. <laughs> I mean, not UV, UI layout for the, for the gamers. All right, so we'll just watch a bit of this. And let's just go like this. And okay, so. So just note that uh, when you get this update, uh, if you are looking for it, it won't get rid of the current layout. So the next one is a sparse class data version, um, which has helped you reduce the footprint of the actor instances. It also added auto in instancing on mobile, which reduces draw costs and improves graphics performance. And included in Unreal Engine 4.24 version is Steam Sockets. And this allows you to take advantage of Valve's recent improvements to the Steam SDK, and you can have a smoother and safer online experience. And just so you know, uh, Steam sockets are stripped from builds for platforms other, other than PCs. Next new feature is the Network Engine Test Suite. And um, you can evaluate RPCs and replication of variables, structs, and arrays in actors and actor components. 
The next thing is the DTLS support. To use the DTL DTLS support, uh, you can enable the DTLS packet handler plugin and add this code into your default engine.ini file. So next is the new Niagara editor system overview. Here's a high level view of a system or emitter being edited. You can easily navigate between different parts of the data. Next thing is new collab viewer template improvements. So to help you with when you're on a team or if like or if you like your or if you have a partner, um, you can draw freely in the scene using your mouse or motion controller. Measure distances between objects and surfaces. Um, save your session um, and return later. And cap easily capture the scene um, to review it later. You can look at the Collab Viewer template documentation in the Unreal Engine documentation. Next it is the new pixel streaming improvement. Uh, this is really great. Um, you can just read all these things that it, it can do. The next event is the event track workflow improvements. There are two big changes here. You can first you can now you can now create a quick binding to add endpoints to the key without needing to go into the sequencer directly blueprint. And that helps you so you can add multiple event tracks and bindings through sequencer. The second thing you can do is um, see all your even bindings and add payload parameters to them. And you can find more information about that in the calling events through sequencers documentation. Next one is the local or master time shot expert. Mm -hmm. Next thing is the tag object bindings and sequencer. The next thing is the sequencer curve editor enhancements. This helps you manipulate curves through the curve editor. Mm -hmm. If you want more information about that, you can go to the sequencer overview uh, documentation. Uh, some more cool things are so you can also uh, evaluate into indi in evaluate individual tracks in a sequence. You can attach objects to a track. Uh, look, do spatialized audio tracks to an object. Skeletal animal loop. An sorry, animal. Skeletal animation <laughs> looping. Uh, you can determine when the loop animation loop begins rather than start at the loop of the beginning of the animation. I also have new template sequences and new chaos fractures toolbars and new AVID DNXHR support to really help you get those high quality um, you know, videos and things like that. I also have the new uh, virtual scouting improvements and the virtual studio sample update. Uh, no image. 
So now that with the 3D with experimental 3D text, which you can create directly in the Unreal Editor, you can uh, font, different fonts you can use are True Type or Open Type, and you can import these into your project. You can uh, take control of the extrusion, the beveling, typographical settings, uh, like like kerning and word spacing. Uh, you can apply your own custom materials to the front, back, sides, and bevels. Cool. Next new feature is the RKit 3.0 support. Uh, and the next thing is the OpenXR support, which helps you simplify AR VR software. And the next feature is the Magic Leap update, which helps you with improved hand meshing support, improved touchpad gesture support, and improved audio support via the Unreal Sound Field plugin. I'm going to skip the video, and so that will do a lot of things, and you can just read it here on my uh, channel, or you can go to the docs and read these more, more of these things. Next feature is material layers. You can combine your layers into stacks using material layer and material layer blend assets. Okay, so, oops, sorry, here we go. So, what are some SDK upgrades for each platform? So we have um, so it's got the Visual Studio, which you'll need minimum supported versions. Mm -hmm. Google Stadia, Switch. All right, so. So the matinee editor is no longer uh, from the cinematics menu, and because they are going to remove matinee from Unreal Engine. All right, so here's debugging tools, navigation. There's just a little description of each kind of thing. Animation. Alright, so that's enough for the um, release notes. Okay, so let me get to the resources that I have for you, and then um, I'll do some a couple more things. Now, the first resource is uh, Tree It. Now, this is a great way to make 3D tree generations. Um, so you can easily make a lot, a lot of different foliage. So they're 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 free, and you can use them with any engine uh, or project. So very easy to create, top quality, uh, many different trees available. 
You can edit the joints and the break joints. Um, you can also render it to an image for leaf creation, adjustable LOD. You can export it to .dbo, .fbx, .obj, .x, and it's free. All right, so and you can install it uh, from the www.evolve-software.com slash tree it. Um, and here's a nice gallery, as you can see, that's really great. You got a cactus, some uh, palm trees. So you can give this a try and um, and see what you can create. All right, so the next resource is Wings 3D. Now this is a polygon modeler. It's apparently quite easy to use. Uh, you can just uh, create things using polygons. Um, uh, developed since 2001. And it's written in Erlang. So it's open sourced and it's, it's free for personal and commercial projects. Um, okay, you can look at a bit of the gallery, what people have created using Wings 3D. And these are just, you know, it was one of many different modelers. And it's just, they say, you know, easy to use. It's easy for you to get up and going. And it, I, you can most likely import this into Unreal Engine. And, and, you know, put it into your um, game, animation, things like that. Cool. So this is amazing. <laughs> nice. I like it. All right. So now it's time for the Indie Dev Shoutout. Okay. So today I am shouting out Tremaine Tory. And uh, he created Sasha Says. And this is a uh, it's a free game, and it has uh, it's available on iPhone and iPad, and uh, it has a 4.9 rating out of 119 ratings. So, what do we have? This is a great game to work your uh, your brain your brain power and your dexterity. You can uh, tap tap the screen, shake the game, um, uh, shake the screen, and just follow what Sasha says and really improve your skills. It's got 1,400 plus users, so if you want to check it out, um, it's uh, free, and just you can do a lot of things, tickle gesture, all these kinds of things. So uh, check out, um, it's has got some great reviews. So check out Tremaine Tory's um, app, Sasha Says, on the App Store, and he also created um, Floaty Jack O, which is a Halloween game. So, again, check out Tremaine Tory on the App Store. All right, so now it's time for our fun activity egghead exam. The exam that you haven't studied for, and either you know the answer or you don't. Number one, which famous actor was rejected to play Mario in the live action film? Number two, which online game is the longest supported game ever? Number three, how many consoles has Madden NFL appeared on? Now it's time for the egghead answers. Number one, Tom Hanks was rejected to play Mario because he didn't have enough clout. Number two, Diablo is the longest ever supported game. It's been supported for 20 years. And number three, Madden NFL has been on 33 consoles. How many did you get right? Leave a comment in the description below. Thanks for watching. Again, this is Ashley Bonner, founder of the Indie Educational Video Game Studio Electric Egghead. Later.